Hey everyone, this is Jeffrey Wu with the Healthier Modern Nutrition HVMN Podcast. And today I want to bring on my friend Stuart of the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. We had a really, uh, I have probably had one of my most interesting, fun podcast appearances on Stuart's podcast. And hopefully we can dive into philosophy, counterculture, and counter mainstream and some of the adventures that Stuart's on in this conversation. So Stuart, great to have you on the program. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm uh, really excited to, to sit down with you again, again from Latin America. Last time we talked, it was from Colombia, and this time I'm in Brazil. So. Yeah, so I, I've been following on social and you're in Brazil, and I know that you've been fairly vocal about how you're choosing to live your life and uh, the decisions don't seem just they're not necessarily just rash that i think they're thought through from the data that you're perceiving and interpreting i mean I, my understanding is that you grew up in the bay area right so you've been kind of a california kid like myself i grew up in la moved to the bay area you know during college and stuck around since but i think with 2020 with pandemic the way I've been really just internalizing and framing it for myself is that this is, we can take it as from a victim's mentality, but I've almost reframed it like we can just not start thinking about our lives in a completely new lens from first principles. And this is almost, if we are fortunate enough, have this as a blessing in disguise where we can redefine what we want to do with our lives. So want to get a little bit of a sense of where you came up from and how, and I think you've in a similar... Uh, Again, a similar journey uh, sounds like as myself in terms of reframing how you want to live your life. Yeah, let's see. Well, we can start more recently or we can go back to a, a lot longer. I did grow up in the Bay Area, so I grew up in Silicon Valley. My father is an investor in technology, but I basically didn't want to. Well, it wasn't like a rational decision that I wa didn't want to be involved uh, that much, but it was just like, that's what my dad does. So I, I'm going to go explore the world and kind of I started to really focus in on... I, what the main universals among cultures are versus uh, what are like culturally divine behaviors versus what are the universals among cultures. So I lived in a lot of different places, including Brazil. Previously, that's where I learned Portuguese and Thailand. You know, I've been very fortunate enough to be able to kind of just go hog wild and exploring what the world has to offer. And then, as you said, 2020 was kind of like a, a big moment for me before probably I would have been not that counterculture, but then the pandemic and our reaction to the pandemic really kind of made me realize how differently I think for most people, including most people in technology. And uh, for me, it was kind of a, a pretty big letdown because technology is supposed to be about data and the response to the pandemic was not about data. Like there is a lot of data uh, as to what lockdowns were eff effectively doing. And, uh, and so I pretty strongly diverged from the tech world and, and w where it kind of headed. And so as you, as you said, it was kind of like a blank slate, like what the, who am I? What the, what, 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 what is this? Like, how do I fit into this world? And yeah. And then, and then I, I was really kind of unhappy with the way that lockdowns were going in California, particularly over the summer. Like, I think if we had not done the lockdowns during the summer, we could, you know, we could have probably had public buy-in for doing some of the things that were important once the wave actually came in winter. And so I got, I, I saw it coming in summer. I was like, there's no way this is going to let down. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to go to the Southern hemisphere because there were signs that it was seasonal and Brazil was open. And so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go to Brazil. Um, ended up being a really good choice because there was a second wave. I wasn't, I didn't actually think there was going to be a second wave. And so I was wrong on that. But uh, yeah, and then I, and then I came to Brazil and it's been a good decision here because ended up getting COVID here as well. But, uh, um, but uh, that wasn't as, I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't as, you know, I, I'm, I'm thankful for the experience of, of getting it. And I know that many people don't, that hurts me that we're going through a pandemic, but yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about your personal experience going through and beating down COVID and kind of the Southern hemisphere version of the, of, of, of the experience. But I think I've been also somewhat lucky to be able to travel safely and see different jurisdictions, I mean, primarily in America, and uh, really just get a sense of the cultural differences of how people treat this current situation. And I feel like even now that I'm back in San Francisco right now, I feel like I'm treading on like thin ice where it's like, oh, if I'm like overly skeptical, or we talk about the things in an overly direct way. It's like, oh, you're our anti-science, anti-rationality, and you've become like a 
far right or you know extremists and it's like again very strange where in other localities other jurisdictions uh, there's a, just a much different energy and openness and conversational ability to talk about this this subject and i think even that seasonality point might be just like a good way to just brought up the conversation which is that just within some of the more open-minded spheres of conversation this notion of covid being a seasonal disease was well discussed but i i like i've not i've not had that type of conversation in the bay area where mm. it's like covid super super serious like it's the, the craziest thing ever like lockdown for one year straight and now i i think as you're saying we're, we're seeing the data patterns that look like that this is a seasonal disease, just like how cold and influenza are seasonal diseases where you expect to see a spike during winter. And then as you go into the warmer periods, case rates go down. And essentially, like the data that I look at, it's like you look at California, which is relatively locked down. You look at Florida, which is relatively open. I just actually came back from Miami. It's the same curve. <laughs> like both kind of cases rise as we entered November, December, and now that we're entering warmer periods, everything's dropping again. And it's literally lockdown, no lockdown. Literally, the shape of the curve looks exactly the same. Yeah, I want to, I want to throw that like at you and just get your sense in terms of the conversations you're having as you're traveling in the Southern Hemisphere. Like, do you sense that tone or, or how are you having these conversations from different parts of the world? So interesting. So interesting to be in Brazil right now. So I speak Portuguese. I'm in a city where there aren't many foreigners. Uh, so my main interactions are in Portuguese every day with Brazilians, mostly doing movement practices, mostly one on one. But I do go to the gym and I basically I, I have a very, very good impression of what it is like for a Brazilian in COVID. And uh, before I want to go back a little bit, I, see, I think what's happening in San Francisco usually happens to the rest of the America about five years beforehand. And that, from what I see, San Francisco has kind of turned into a postmodern dystopia, specifically postmodern. So there's modernity, which was, you know, the U.S. from 1950s to 1980s or whatever. That was like where we had strong social cohesion among the in-group. There was an out-group, of course, and, and there wasn't any social cohesion for that. So Brazil is in a similar sense that it's a modern, modernizing country, maybe modern now. In Curitiba, the city that I've found myself in is a modern city. And basically, the social cohesion is still here. And so... There are a few things that people do basically to be like, okay, yes, there is a pandemic. We are going to do these things. I don't think they do that much in terms of actually like stopping the virus. The two main things are wearing masks and alcohol gel. And so like everybody is doing those two things. And that's the way that everybody's getting through the pandemic. They're still seeing their families. People still hang out with their families. There is a little bit of, of, of tension and shame. You know, like if I'm in an Uber and I pass by a bunch of people partying on the street, the Uber driver will be like, you know, these assholes, like, what are they doing on the side of the street? What are they doing hanging out? But of course, like, this is the craziest thing for me is just like, knowing what I've researched about the pandemic, and I'm not an expert at all, everything I should say should be fact checked. It's just like outdoors, nobody's getting it outdoors. Yet, there's no nuance in the conversation here in Brazil or back in, in the States as well about like, well, we should probably all be spending all the time. If we're worried about it, we should all be spending our time outdoors. So that's one kind of interesting thing about Brazil and the social cohesion that seems to exist as from an outsider's perspective. And then you mentioned Cal California, Florida, both of those curves look the same. And, and anybody who basically takes a lockdown pro pro lockdown approach needs to explain why Florida, Tennessee, South Dakota, and Sweden all with different cultures, all don't have lockdowns, basically the same death rates and the same hospitalization rates. And if we can't explain that, and then usually when I bring this up, this is about where people start to say, oh, but lockdowns weren't meant to stop deaths. They were meant to slow down deaths in order to save the hospitalization or save the hospitals. But again, we see the same hospitalization rates. And also, it doesn't look like they did slow it down. Who knows? Maybe they did. I, I don't think they did. And so, yeah, that's the, the rundown on what, what I think you said. Hey, guys, this is Jeff Wu interrupting my podcast for a special offer, a special announcement for you. As you might know, HVMN just launched the new Keto Food Bar. And they're yummy. They're delicious. And I want to make a special personal offer for you to give you a discount to get those into your hands. So for a limited time only, Use the discount code Jeff10. That's G E O F F number one, number zero. Jeff10 for a 10% discount on the keto food bar on HVMN.com. We got 
Mexican hot chocolate, one of my personal favorites. We got vanilla shortbread, we got chocolate chunk, and of course, we got the everything bagel, which is legit savory, garlicky, oniony. And these have become staples in my own personal life. I like to eat this with a cup of coffee for breakfast. I've been using the Mexican hot chocolate, the vanilla as grab and go bars when I'm biking, when I'm out on the town, when it's not easy for me to eat healthy, eat keto. So these are certified organic. They actually are yummy. They aren't these weird synthetic artificial tasting bars you might see that are keto compliant, but have a bunch of fake IMOs and things that actually spike glycemic response. And of course, while they're also certified organic and they actually taste good, these have been tested on continuous glucose monitors. So they actually have flat glycemic response on your blood sugar. So essentially it's a, a fasting mimetic, but we're still delivering almost 300 calories of healthy fat and 12 grams of healthy protein and grass-fed collagen. These are legit. I'm so excited for you to try them and use my personal discount code, Jeff10, to get a special 10% discount. So check it out and enjoy and back to the program. To clarify, I don't, I don't think, like for me, I'm not trying to get coronavirus and I've actually been tested a couple of times the last couple of weeks because I have been traveling uh, more, more, more mobile and I've been lucky to have avoided being infected both from the antibodies and the PCR perspective. But talk us through your personal experience and bout with COVID. I mean, I think that's always kind of an interesting story and journey. I've, I mean, just traveling, I've met a lot of people who said it was like not a problem at all, right? I think you're starting to see more and more of these stories where it's like, hey, like I just couldn't smell and eat for like a day or just felt kind of crappy for a day and then I got over it. And then of course, you have like, and I have coworkers who have family members who died, right? And it's just like, man, it's a weird disease. It definitely seems to be very, very scary and dangerous for our elderly and for folks with comorbidities, right? If you have diabetes, metabolic issues, if you're overweight, if you have low vitamin D status, definitely be more cautious. But for folks that, you know, we're relatively young and I presume healthy, healthy seeming, it, 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 like it has been really a nothing burger on that front. So again, I think that's why it's, this is such a controversial, hard to wrap around disease because it's the, the, the outcomes are so polarized. It literally can be you, you die to, oh, uh, this is like a, a cold, eh, nothing. Like what the hell are we doing destroying our entire livelihoods and economy for like a cold? Yeah. And, if, and for everyone's local perspective, it can be true, right? It looks true from their lens. Curious to hear about your experience. Yeah, well, I think you mentioned some interesting themes there. Uh, the well, let's start with my first experience. Hopefully, I'll remember everything else I want to say. But so I, you know, I've I've been I was like my life doesn't really revolve too many or too much around doing group events anyway. So I didn't come here specifically to do group events. I'm mostly doing one-on-one um, -on -one classes. I felt that that was safe, and so I, I did it. I was I, I have a dance teacher down here, and I remember I went into her room to do the to the, do the dance class. And I saw it on her face. I was like, oh, she could be sick. And I was like, oh, but you know, I didn't really make anything, didn't really connect it with COVID. And then we had the dance class. And then, and then about two days later, as I was headed to a massage uh, with my massage therapist, who I had seen the day before, she's like, oh, you know, I, 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 I'm sick right now. And I was in an event a week ago and there was somebody else who was tested positive. Um, so, you, you know, you should feel yourself. And I had actually already started to feel very sore. But I thought that was related to the massage and, and, and Pilates that I was doing. And then I put it together and I was like, oh, oh, I've, I, yeah, I've got COVID now. And then started to get really, really sore for about two days, you know, very flu-like for two days, very, very flu-like. And then I was like, okay, but I'm really healthy. I'm going to get through this really quickly. But it was really interesting, that psychological aspect of being like, was this made in a lab, you know, or like, how crazy is this? Like, I've, I've heard so much fear about this disease. It, how much of that fear that I've heard went into my unconscious and is going to make this thing bad? Because there is obviously a dimension of, 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 of placebo in, in what... Psychosomatic, yeah. And, uh, and so it was bad for two days and then I started to get better. And that was the craziest thing because I started to get better and then I was like... Um, and then it would be like another three days and I'd be like, okay, I'm about to be, I'm about to be out, you know? And I was, I stayed in my room for, for the full t 10 days of, 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 
when we're supposed to be doing it canceled everything i was just on my own and then that, that was the craziest thing about covid was just like the it just went on and on and on um so it was for about it was about three weeks where i was basically low energy a lot of depression a lot of a lot of crazy stuff coming up mentally I, I i considered many times just coming home and like what the hell am i doing in brazil and then i started to get better and then i started and now i'm like in the best shape of my life because i've been doing these like a crazy amount of exercise with physical trainers which is really cool and then maybe we could talk about that too as a kind of a later side of I've discovered this kind of way of learning a language and way of just training um i know i bet you know it because you you interview people one-on-one -on -one. so you get a download every time that you interview somebody because i do it as well so i know that that i get this one-on-one -on -one, like oh i'm just going to like download a, this whole person's worldview i'm going to get a good idea that also works for any sort of physical training that you want to do and like i've been just now I'm in the best shape of my life. And it's, that's a question of whether I go back or not. And I've been dealing with chronic pain issues for a long time. And that was the craziest thing about the, the, this particular soreness of the muscles that it felt like COVID went into my muscles and kind of zapped out the chronic pain. Uh, I still deal with it, but I'm like really, really close to solving it, particularly with all the stuff I'm doing. So as you were dealing in, were you using supplements, therapeutics, like, or was it, you just toughed it out? Like, you go to the hospital and you see a primary care practitioner any any tips i don't know if it's tips but any like things that you thought was like reasonable for if a listener is out there it's like oh like i'm relatively young i uh, maybe i need to go to the hospital or not but maybe i want to tough it out well you know how how do you think through it uh no definitely it was it was definitely a tough it out type of situation for me except i did i was taking magnesium and uh, cbd oil with a, with a small amount of thc and i think that is it seemed like it did an effect, you know, I, I don't know what the other side of it would have been if I hadn't taken those that, but it felt like it led to a faster recovery, but you know, who, who knows? But yeah, CBD with a little bit of THC felt, felt pretty good. And then since then the, it's just become like, put it so much more into my mind, get vitamin D. And so now I figured out a way to work in the sun with my computer in the shadow and I work in the sun with as much body as I got this from Dr. Cameron Seppa, who I think you've interviewed before, uh, just like as much of your body exposed to the sun as possible from like 11 to 3 p.m. Uh, so I've been doing that afterwards. And that has led to like crazy, like just good feeling, uh, well-being dopamine. Because that what I found out is that your eyes actually, the the, the eyes are where most of the, the, the vitamin D comes in or most of the sun rate exposure comes in and you want two hours a day of your sun being in area of your eyes being in the sun basically um and then the the relationship between vitamin d and dopamine is really interesting yeah that's something that i've just been really focused on from the very very beginning yeah get out in the sun right like the i i think that's like almost where i think conventional health public guidance is problematic because you're telling people to sit in a freaking box and like not exercise and not breathe and not get sun. And it's like, hey, like vitamin D status is one of the highest associational metrics you can kind of control that I think it's it's so associational that it's like, okay, it's likely causative in terms of like serious outcomes where it's like no downside, but it's like so beneficial, right? And I, got, I just made sure to, when I was out in Miami, like got a lot of sun. When I'm in San Francisco, I try to work in, you know, similar to you, work from my roof deck and rooftop and get as much sun as possible. Yeah, just Sunday that you're like taking phone calls. And yeah, again, I don't know. My N equals one is that like, again, knock on wood, I don't plan on getting COVID, but relatively smooth sailing. And I don't know if that's just because I'm just super lucky or maybe, you know, just taking care of the body, having re reasonable metabolic health, having reasonable vitamin D status and trying to stay active and not be a locked in zoo animal has been, and, you know, that's been my experience at least. That's been the craziest thing is just like the focus on indoors. Cause I mean, another thing is a lot of people indoors in urban environments are on central air systems, which are moving the virus through the central air system. Like the, the complete like lack of any sort of real inquiry into what is being told uh, is really just like mind boggling. And, and the, the degree to which people accept it is also mind boggling because so far, you know, even in 1918, and I don't want to even compare 1918 to, to, to COVID because they're not at all the same thing. The average mortality rate of, of 1918 was like 40 average rate mortality rate of COVID is about 83 or 82 or something like that. So they're not, they're not even in the same class, but you know, in 1918, they were, they were outside 
for most of the time. Um, and I want to say that, you know, as of now, they're not in the same class. It could be that COVID, you know, has a third or fourth wave and it does mutate to something much more dangerous, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, like, knock on, again, knock on wood, like, there's the UK variant that looks like it's a little bit higher infectivity rate, R, R0 is higher, potentially higher fatality rate. And I think there's a South African one that looks a little scary. So, I mean, I, I again, I don't want to, I don't think we're both, I mean, you went through it, right? I don't think we're flippant about the seriousness. And again, like friends who have, and coworkers who've lost loved ones and, and, and a lot of economic carnage and all of that. But I think the point is that like so many low hanging fruit is not being discussed. And it's, there's a, there's absolutely a feeling of like censorship of like, do not challenge the public dogma. Otherwise you're unscientific. And I think this is affecting all of us and we should have. And I think that's the only way to get real buy-in have real conversations. But what we're seeing, how do we reconcile our firsthand experience with everyone else's experience? I think that is just human nature. Yeah. And for me, it's like I, I starting out 2020, I was I was in Colombia when I first heard about it. You know, both of us are on Twitter and, and we probably, uh, you know, I heard about it as I think it was late December, early January. And it's like, OK, I, I want to go back to America. I don't want to be in Colombia for this. I'm going to go back to America. And I got back to America. And 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 it's been really interesting, my viewpoint on that. But essentially, like, I don't trust public health uh, anymore. It's like my, my trust has been completely destroyed. I, I think there are, I don't, I don't think there are ulterior motives, but I think there are really screwed up incentives. And it will probably be a long time until, until somebody can kind of provide me with the, I don't know what I need to in order to trust the public health system again. It's like, uh, and, and I, you know, I'm, I know I'm somewhat at least, I, I speak about it. Not many people, other people speak about it. There are obviously voices that are speaking the same thing that I'm, and I'm getting a lot of information from them, but a lot of my friends, you know, all I get from the feedback whenever I start to speak is just like anger and, and projection and fear. And, and so it's hard. Uh, I forgot where I was going with that, but, uh, yeah, but essentially yeah, it's like, I, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's anger. Right. Cause I think it's like, I, I think, and it's, and it's a, and I understand it's like, Oh, my love, what my love family member, X or Y or Z died. How could you be so callous or upset? And I think it's, and I think it, there is some care and diplomacy yeah. and compassion for that, right? Where it's like, yeah. no, of, like this is serious. A lot of people are dying and, and, or having like long term health issues from it. But how do we not take, but, but how do we find like the balance of actually letting people have their livelihoods, right? Like we're crushing small businesses, like, in, like people, like, and social lives are being completely destroyed. People are, are suicide rate is up. Drug addiction rates are up. I mean, it just, there's a, this is not just a unidimensional problem. This is affecting 7 billion people's lives. And, and quality of life issues. And then also like we have to, we have to understand, and this is the, the problem because I, and I understand it because emotions can run so deeply that we, we, t we identify with those emotions. And then anybody who can kind of, who's kind of like trying to change those emotions. We protect ourselves from those things. And I understand it. It all makes sense. I do it. Um, I'm not doing it for, for this particular thing, but I do it in other areas of my life. But we have to ask ourselves, did lockdowns work? If And did lockdowns work for stopping the virus? Did lockdowns work for saving lives? Did lockdowns work for saving hospitals? And if they did, then I can understand that people say like, okay, you saying that a lockdown is not working when it is in fact working, then, you know, you have a responsibility for, for a loss of life or, or um, contributing to that. But everything we've seen so far based on the p places that don't do lockdowns um, that are still part of the Western tradition of not like locking people in their, in their rooms, like, uh, full of style. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's just like, there's no evidence that, that lockdowns work. And the craziest thing is that, you know, I, this is why I got on, the, on this train was that I heard about this virus in December 20, 25th, December 26th. And I was reading everything about quarantine. And then, and I've been following infectious diseases for a long time because I'm, because they are the Achilles heel of humanity. They're so dangerous. And so I remember reading about quarantine and just being like, okay, quarantine is of sick people. And then seeing Wuhan, Wuhan, and then Wuhan all of a sudden was like, quarantine is everybody. And being like, and then all the epidemiologists I was reading were like, well, we don't really know whether that'll work. It might save some people. It might it might slow it down a little bit, might slow it down, but we don't really know. And then you go back, like everything in 2019, before 2019, lockdowns were like, like, well, yeah, they could work, but you know, like it would kind of lead to the destruction of our way of life. 
which it has. And then you go to the other two kind of similar pandemics and along the same range of mortality, actually worse than, than COVID as well. Um, 1957 and 1968. In both of those cases, there was no hint of a lockdown. And it's not like they didn't have that idea that, okay, well, we do know that viruses kind of transmit between people in the, in the air and, you know, germ theory, th those were all clearly there. So like the idea that we could just stop it from just not staying apart is, and then, and then the craziest argument that I get back from that is it's like, then they compare it to gravity. Like it's a physical law that, that if you just keep people apart, then they won't get the disease. And it's like, yeah, if you can set up a perfect environment where you can keep two people apart and apply it to everyone everywhere at all times, including in developing countries like Brazil, where they can't actually do it. There's no way they can actually do it. And it's like, it's like, it's not gravity. It's like, it, it requires human behavior change, which they were able to do in Wuhan. If we believe the data of China that, that, like they were able to do that. They were able to do like, like, like that. That was very authoritarian, right? That was communist party of China being boom, iron law, like literally like soldiers and like community communist party members were like taping people in their houses. Right. Like, yeah. So I think like that probably would work. Right. But like that probably will not fly in America. And <laughs> we know? shouldn't. Yeah. I, I, I like, I don't want to live in an America that would, it would fly because like, that's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong for the government to do that. I'm curious because like, I think that not a lot of people have been able to kind of see different jurisdictions. And one thing that I thought was interesting was like how people greet each other now. I remember like the first couple of days I was in Miami, I was like, holy crap. Like I was like literally culture shock. Like, oh man, I'm for sure going to get COVID. Uh -huh. And people were like outdoors. People were like pretty normal. I mean, people are definitely scared and and like, I think respectful, but like some people, I guess, were like going back to like bro hugs or, and it's been interesting to me. Like some people offer me the elbow, people offer the fist bump, <laughs> people offer handshake and some people hug. I think it's just funny. And one thing that when, like that I've just like done is that when people offer me the elbow bump, I just like fist bump their elbow. Cause like, <laughs> elbow, I'm not doing the elbow bump, man. Nah, it's like, it's actually like strictly worse cause I'm getting closer to you. I'll just fist bump your elbow. Uh -huh. Like for me, I think at this point, like I'll just like match whatever the room is. Uh -huh. Like, like I can wave at you. I'm happy just waving. I'm happy to put my mask on indoors. I'm happy to fist bump you, you know? So like, you know, if, if people are all negative in a room, you know, it can be a little bit more normal, but I think that's where I'm like netting out. And I think it's going to be interesting for all of us as we all exit this lockdown. It'll be like an interesting culture shock. Like, I'm curious in terms of like, ha ha like, have you sensed that? Have you seen that? Like when you kind of are, are on the move, how are people greeting each other in your, in your next world? In Brazil, Brazil specifically, usually, you know, the last time I was in Brazil eight years ago, like this is a, you kiss everybody on the cheek twice, you know, very, very like intimate. Uh, and that, that doesn't exist at the moment. And so I'm mostly fist bumping people. Uh, every once in a while, there's a hug and it's like, it really depends on the relationship. And it's, it's, it just feels like people are more realistic about it here. It feels like their nervous systems are more grounded uh, in the sense like, and I think it has something to do with the fact that they're still seeing their families. Um, uh, Cause like I've, I've done what most people are in San Francisco were just forced to do, which is to like have all of your social relationships online because I've been, tra I've traveled a bunch. And so I've done, a, and I've done a lot of meditation retreats. So I've been I like understand that it's really interesting to it, but it's a stressor. It's a stressor when we, when we force all of our social relationships online, because there's so many in details that you can, you can adapt to by going online fully. You can adapt to it over time. But I realized with COVID for me, for me personally, like the whole, the way that I was able to do that 80% of my interactions online was I had a 20%, which was in-person massage, like the most intimate, like, like the, uh, social connection between two beings basically. And that helped me. To, and like, and then that got destroyed with COVID and my mental health started to go really poorly. And in, in, in particular, once the fire started to come in California, that was really a rough time because I couldn't step outside for a month and a half. And, uh, and then just looking, looking where California was going. But then, so like now that I, I'm here in Brazil, it feels like people are more grounded, more rational, more realistic. And they're, you know, they're doing the things that they think they're doing and to keep themselves safe and they're treating it seriously, but they're not treating it like, in San Francisco, like I, I, the, you mentioned the end game, you mentioned that as we come out of this, and I'm, I'd be curious to hear from you when, what you think is the, is the game plan. I, I imagine by April or March, and, it, and I wonder what the, what the trigger is going to be 
is it just going to be the CDC saying, okay, rates are going down, everybody's getting vaccinated. Do the, does everybody go back to normal once the CDC says it's normal? Or is it, is it, is it going to be a, like a, like, it's going to be really interesting to see that, I think. My, okay, I want to put myself on a limb here. And then um, that, let's, let's, let's compare hypotheses or predictions. And maybe we have the same prediction. But I think I saw a sneak peek of what America and the rest of the world will look like through Miami. And I think there's going to be so much animal energy and spirit pent up that it's just going to be like, I think when the summer comes, when cases will continue to fall, I think the vaccine will be rolled out. I think there'll be some tipping point where it's like, let's travel, like revenge travel, like people will be partying, people will be spending, people are going to like go full carpe diem, let's live life. And this is not a, this is not like a, I encourage that or discourage it. I think that's just literally my rational observation and prediction. Like I don't have a moral judgment on that. I just think that like, it's been super hard for a lot of us in 2020. And as this thing, as vaccines roll out, as the cases come down through summer, I think people are going to go have a blast. This is going to be roaring 20s. I think it's going to be like party, I think with stimulus, another 1.9 trillion injecting the system, stock market is going to continue ripping. Everyone's just going to be spending. Everyone's going to be traveling. I think it's going to be a wild time. That's yeah. my prediction. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I hope it lets out like a, it, maybe I'll play the devil's advocate, but like, you know, what if we're stuck in a limbo land of like another year of masks everywhere? I'm sure. I mean, I, I, I don't, I wonder about San Francisco because there's so much energy in San Francisco invested in the ideological structure that they're saving the universe by staying in their, in their rooms. And I wonder how long it's going to take to reverse that. And would it like, wouldn't it be crazy if it, all it took was the CDC to be like, Hey, you guys can go, go hang out now. Like go, go, go at it. Like, like, or, or would it be the San Francisco state? It was so interesting back in March to like see that happen, like see it at a city level because San Francisco was the first city, like you know, and, and that was the first city to go on the shelter in place. And then, um, but yeah, yeah, we'll see. I mean, again, I it's like I'm not encouraging people to be reckless or not reckless. I think that just I that is my like odds maker best hypothesis. And um, we'll see how it plays out. The travel thing. What do you think about travel? I'll, I'll give you some kind of a. So I'm outside of the country right now and it's been on my mind a lot. My, my plane ticket was just canceled because uh, my plane ticket back was set for next Wednesday on Copa Airlines, which is a Panamanian airline. But then the Biden administration basically shut off travel for all Brazilians to the United States. So then it just basically tanked a bunch of airlines. Um, I know the Netherlands, they had to shut off all of their international airlines too as well because of, because of the, uh, the lockdown that they, that they did. Uh, so it's like, I have no idea what's going to happen to international airlines. But so the craziest thing is that the Americans, as an American, I can c continue to fly back and forth to Brazil as long as Brazil doesn't close its borders, which d looks like it won't. So there's going to be like a crazy kind of like, and, and then you mentioned, and you mentioned that people are going to want to travel as well. And so it's going to be really weird. And then I saw another uh, strange kind of fact that like vaccines in Brazil isn't going to happen until 2022. Although they're going pretty quick here, but they chose the Chinese version of the vaccine, which might not be as effective. And then Africa is like 2022, 2023, uh, where they're going to get fully vaccinated. So there's going to be a re like, and it's just so gnarly how how all we can't even have a discussion about the effects that this had on the rest of the developing world, which was like being you know brought out of poverty at a rapid rate, and has now just been kind of just like well plunged back, right? Because like a lot of their economies are based on hospitality. Well, I, I think part of it like that. You know, I was spending some time with a f good friend who's really involved in the European hospitality industry and a lot of their projections, like, you know, this is like industry data, like large European hospitality data th that they expect like a nice rebound in summer. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, I think that, that, that that's where it's like, I think that there needs to be a pragmatic conversation because if you save people from dying of COVID, but you destroy like two years of people's education, people's small businesses, people's livelihoods, and then they get addicted to drugs and or kill themselves and or like lose their decades of blood, sweat and tears in their business and it gets vaporized. Like I cannot be the person that says, hey, one is better than the other. And I think a lot of people that are on the downside of it are saying, hey, let me have a fighting chance, right? I think that's why there's been so much, I think, protests around the world. And so much anger because 
like I empathize a lot with that. It's like if you're just telling, if you're trying to save my life by killing like everything I care about, is that like is that the right trade? And I think it's and again, I think it, it, the world is so big. It's so hard to govern such so many people. Like I'm, it's above my pay grade to offer a solution. But I empathize with that viewpoint. Well, let's let's go into kind of the philosophy because I really enjoyed our last conversation. Both of us are able to kind of go down the rabbit holes that 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 I think a lot of people are prevented from going down. So what do you think about, there, there's been a concerted move to basically move most of our life online. And where does that lead? Where does it go in terms of, you know, cause we have some pretty challenging events on the horizon, particularly if climate change continues to change as it does. And like this, this idea that we're moving our consciousness. Most of our consciousness is now being mediated through online pipes. What do you think of the significance of that is? And like, how did COVID change it? And then also like, we could talk about like opportunities as well. Like what are the opportunities in that? Yeah, no, I, I mean this, yeah, this is, I, yeah, like this is cool. Like, you're almost like you're prompting the podcast. I want to be asking the <laughs> questions, but Hey, I think this is a good question. Right. Um, it's a habit. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't know. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting, frame to think about i mean i think i think the fidelity for online experience is still too low right like i imagine that we i I would just have a much better time if we were sitting in in a room together or outside on a patio having this conversation i think we are still animals we still have this like sixth sense of like i can sense your animal energy read your micro expressions that is still not expressed through a virtual pipe and i think this especially relates to the current conversation in silicon valley of like these pipes are owned by random bureaucrats within these companies, right? Like some unappointed, unelected policy person is shutting down like the president of the United States or the 45th president's Twitter account. Like, I don't know. I mean, I think, I I think I, I, like there's good arguments on both sides, right? Inciting violence versus like, Hey, that's kind of weird. Do you really want like, like half the time people are like, Oh, Twitter is too powerful. Like they shouldn't arbitrate this stuff. And then like they shut down someone's platform because you happen to agree with that move. You're like, all oh, right, like nice authoritarian move there, Twitter. But then you're from the other side, you're like, oh my gosh, like literally this, co- you, you just l- set a precedence where a company executive can just like turn on, turn you on and off. And that's like a, I, I still don't think it's like fully understood implication, right? And I think when we're saying, hey, let's upload our lives to these platforms and you literally are letting this company executive again, like I think the Twitter VP that like the safety policy Vijaya, she's on, you know, some, some nice lady is like making this decision and it's like, I, no one knows who she is. Like no one elected her <laughs> yeah. and she's deciding like who's on or off. And that is a weird, weird precedent that we should be very, very careful about. And it, you know, it gets into the idea of a nation state. Cause like, what is a nation state? We have the United States and that's like where people have a citizenship and where they physically spend their time and where there's a bunch of resources and they might have property and all these different things. But then, you know, in the last year, everybody's now lived their lives pretty much entirely in front of a computer screen. And, you know, if is, is a nation state about where your physical location is, or is it where your mind state is? Cause if it's where your mind state is, then there is a good argument, I think, to be made that, that we're now looking at the next evolution in terms of a nation state. And it's probably going to have a lot to do with linguistic barriers. So like I, I can kind of enter this Brazilian nation state that's also mixed with Portugal and Angola and all these different places. But and so I'm spending a lot of time on on this online thing. And then and then, as you mentioned, somebody can kind of just flip that switch and be like, OK, well, you don't get to talk anymore on, on this nation state. And, and I, I tried to investigate this with a, a, a lawyer, Preston Barn on Twitter. Uh, we did an interview on Twitter itself and, you know, figuring out what free speech is because I was really interested in it. And, uh, you know, the me- I think the craziest thing is that the media is protected from the government. So so essentially it's not like the Twitter is protected from the government and it's not considered that Twitter is part of the government and it's not really part of the government, but then there's the whole idea of the fourth estate or manufacture of consensus is an idea by Noam Chomsky, which basically shows how the media, they did it in Iraq war, the 2003, that was the first time I ever saw it was when basically the the media supported the the institutional drive towards war with, with, with Iraq. And I definitely saw it in 2020. And so like the media, and now like, what is the relationship between the media and institutions? 
And I, I just realized yesterday that I think it's hard to really say that there's a separation between corporation and state at the moment, because after 2008, the amount of money that went into the you know, in directly into corporations because they were too big to fail. You know, what is too big to fail? Is that national? Like that's traditionally back in the fifties or sixties, like here in Brazil, they nationalized the shit out of all the industries. And so what's the difference between that and that? And it's like, well, it's kind of this corporate thing that's, you know, in the structure of the United States now, it's like lobbying has taken such a powerful, influential role in the, in where, our, where our government is going. And it's like, where does, you know, and the, and the way it works is you have a, a politician who gets elected, who build, who builds these relationships. And then after they get on the politician, they go into a revolving door where they go into the policy, the lobbying groups. And it's like, so where's the different differentiation, differentiation between the corporation and the state. And so I talked to this lawyer as well. And also a corporation is considered a human being and under like a, a corporation has the same rights as the unit as a, as a human being. So, so that it's like this weird thing where the government now, the, the, the corporations are protected from the government, but the government isn't protected from the corporations. So it's an interesting problem that I, I, I don't think we've even begun to kind of see where this one is headed. Yeah, and I think that's actually like, I think uh, interesting kind of worms that there is a competition of which kind of governance and corporate relationships will even win, right? But I think you, you, you're already starting to see like a great power struggle between China and the United States where there are actual state-owned enterprises and you can make the argument that essentially with like Tencent, Alibaba, they're like all the top guys are Communist Party members. Jack Ma went out of line a little bit and boom, like Xi Jinping just, you know, cut him down by the knees and showed it like who's, who's really the, who, who's really the emperor in, in China right now. I mean, I think if you take the most cynical look, right? Like we have essentially, at least in America, some semblance of rule of law, rule of institution where there is a separation from a corporate entity from, the state where that that bound is not does not really exist in, in in China. But I think like even if you look at like SpaceX and Space Force and Elon Musk, like I think one observation that I've had is that like literally Elon Musk is too big to fail. Like he represents like the Space Force of America. And my understanding of the space race is that China is potentially equal, if not a little bit ahead in space warfare capability. And it's like Elon Musk and SpaceX who are like keeping us relevant with rockets and that can land itself, reusable rockets. And like, if he goes down, like literally like US competitiveness in terms of defense and space capabilities goes down. So I think it's like, and I, I, I'm just curious, like when Elon Musk was trolling SEC, remember when he was like, oh, you know, funding secured at 420, when like pretty clearly that didn't exist. <laughs> Like, I'm just like wondering, maybe the intelligence community or the defense community is like, hey, SEC, let's, 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 uh, let's, let's find him a little bit. Let's make him pay 20 million bucks, which is like nothing for him. Let's like make him like, make him like not post on social media too much, but let's let him go because we need him to like make us competitive in space. Like, I don't know, that's conspiracy, but just from an outside look in with the understanding of the capability of where this, our, our country, America needs to go, it's like, well, yeah, we need to have like real effort on space. And Elon Musk is like running the space program for America. And like, yeah, is he kind of like uh, basically a arm of the United States military industrial, you know, sovereignty? It's so interesting. So first, I want to just make a note on, do you think that Jeff Bezos stepping down as Amazon, as CEO of Amazon has anything to do with the space race? And then... Yes. You do, you do think it, you think that's where it's headed? I think, yes. I, I think he's like, man, Elon is like playing towards like most interesting human in, in our generation. And, and Jeff Bezos is like, damn. Got to get in on that. I want to be with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then, and then the other thing is there are some interesting things that have happened in terms of the, the way that the CP, thinks about diplomacy and, you know, how much trade is involved in CCP in the United States and like also academic institutions and the degree to which academic institutions have money from China that, that are, that is coming into their, um, uh, that plays a role. And then not to mention Silicon Valley as well. There's quite a significant part of Silicon Valley that does have money from, you know, as you said, these state actors. So that's the strangest thing. Cause that doesn't, I don't think it really happens in reverse. Maybe it does. I mean, the United States is incredibly really powerful. Right? Yeah. Like, I think that's where like, it's very wide or very interesting, right? Like 
Facebook can't, Google can't go to China. Facebook can't go to China. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think it's been very interesting because that firewall allowed China to incubate its own technology giants, right? Amazon is not in business in China. It's Alibaba and PDD and some of these other e-commerce companies. But look at what Europe did. Europe let um, us go in there and just completely own their entire internet infrastructure, right? And it's like, it's very interesting, right? Like Europe is uh, very much second, like they're not, I mean, they're I, I, like, maybe there's like one thing that like will sound very crass or aggressive, but I think how I see Europe is that it will be like the Disneyland for rich Americans and rich Chinese people, wow. right? It just like literally, they're just like, you go visit the Coliseum, you go buy some like Louis Vuitton bags in Paris and you go like party in Mykonos and it'll be like rich tourists from either America or China doing that. Yeah. Cause like there's no economic real infrastructure being built there, right? Like they're not leading in technology. They're not leading in physical manufacture besides luxury, right? Like, yeah, I'm, you know, you know, French wine, French Bordeaux is always going to be like a luxury good, right? Like Italian leather is going to be like, you know, top of the world. Like only these cultural items, right? You want like the Gucci and the Louis Vuitton. But in terms of like real economic power, they, like literally the tech industry got taken over by Americans. Well, and, and I mean, not only there too, you know, I can, I can give you some insight into Brazil, which I don't think a lot of people have. Uh, the degree to which WhatsApp has become the main, you know, the main communication channel is like, it's, it's not even a, a joke. And then, and then Facebook has always been very, very popular in, in, in Brazil. The level to which American companies own the, although there are a few, a few interesting things coming out of Brazil as well. And there, I think there's going to continue to be as well. But we're looking at a, it's so interesting, the political playing field right now, because, you know, we've got China, as we just discussed, has a, access to the United States infrastructure and is somehow influencing a lot with a lot of money into that. The United States can't do the same thing to China. Um, right. Russia probably doesn't like China. Russia definitely doesn't like America. Europe and <laughs> Russia, though, that's going to be a crazy thing. And then you've got the developing world. You've got Africa, Nigeria. It's like they're going to have 400 million people. They're like young, dynamic, English-speaking country, but also has a relationship with China. But it's not like China has done the best job in terms of like actually making people feel all right with what's going on. And then, you know, I saw it in Colombia too. There's also Chinese influence in, in Colombia. I'm, I'm really interested to see. I haven't done much investigation into it, the relationship between China and Brazil. I'm actually, uh, for my future going forward, I, I think your listeners will enjoy this, is that, you know, I, I, I see America is going to be is a very, very dynamic country. And partic particularly as we move into a kind of a more decentralized power structures, I think the what represent what America represents, the ideals, the values of America are very popular around the world and are going to continue to be very popular. But then I, I worry about the fragility of the actual like system in America. And so I worry about that and I'm, I'm making moves to, to basically go to what's called a bioregionalism, have my own farm, basically grow my own food in there. But I'm also considering having a second like hedge in Brazil, basically, because Brazil is modern, modernizing, but it had the, the bureaucracy that here hasn't gotten to the same degree that we've seen the pandemic have in the United States. The bureaucracy, like, cause it was kind of crazy what the, what the United States bureaucracy did with with the lockdown like it was it was pretty like intense that didn't happen here to the same degree because the, the government doesn't have as much power here there's a lot we can talk about in terms of geopolitics but i wanted to like talk about your movement practice i mean i mean like i've been following you on social and like a lot of dance a lot of capoeira 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 capoeira, capoeira. <laughs> capoeira. Yeah. Uh, and i think for me like i think i always thought that was very intriguing because like as I've gotten more attuned to human performance, obviously like functional movement is so important, right? Like I think a lot of people when they talk about working out, they do like some weight machines or something. And it's like, okay, it's better than doing nothing, but like functional movement, flexibility, strength with, with actual useful movement is, is so important. So uh, when I saw you exploring and diving deep into, in, into those practices, I was like, hey, that's, that's pretty interesting. And obviously I think just from a body control perspective, again, like, dancing is like not easy to like match a rhythm right there's so many i'm sure that saw some listeners like you can't dance because you have like no rhythm you have very poor body control in capoeira right like it's like quite hard to like match rhythm and control in that way so curious to hear your journey into the, your movement practice i'm so excited about this because this is like this is this is, it feels like my peak right now in terms of my understanding of what's going on i i I weighed about 15 years ago, I weighed 315 pounds and I couldn't breathe. I had asthma. Um, I was uh, just like a 
a very sick person. You know, I was healthy in the, in the general sense, but I was like very, very sick. And so I got into yoga about 10 years ago. And that was really kind of a very, very helpful thing for giving me my baseline in terms of movement. And then over the past seven years have really gotten into the deepest layers of how sick I was and kind of healed those layers using movement and movement by far. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. There's movement, there's massage, there's dance, there's music, there's just like limitless amounts of therapy in order to, to, to heal the nervous system. And so recently, uh, I've been coming to a lot of interesting conclusions about how does one, we were talking about sunlight the other day, and I remember this quote, I'll never forget the quote about the Rwand- Rwandan genocide. And afterwards, the UN sent um, psychologists and they put the psychologist in dark rooms with people who had gone through the genocide. Uh, and then the Rwandans were like, ah, no, no, thanks. Uh, like, uh, I'm going to go out and drum with my friends in the sun. So essentially, it's like movement. Movement's really interesting because there's all sorts of types of different movements that we can do. You know, there's walking, there's running, there's jumping, there's all these different, there's spinning. And all of these have an effect. And I think if we use it or lose it type of thing. And so Capoeira, I found about six months ago back when the fire was fires were happening and capoeira is one of the most interesting things because it's a martial art but it's also a dance uh and so you don't actually fight the person although there is an actual living tradition here in brazil which i've started to to understand that it's like real and that people use it as an actual martial art for protection here but there but a lot of it is a dance and a game and everybody's playing music and i i've never found such a complete movement practice in my life like cuz yoga i was under the spell that they said that basically yoga was a complete movement practice that you didn't need to do anything else that you could just do vinyasa yoga and i don't think that's true i think yoga is not a, move, a complete practice but with capoeira you have movement and not only movement but you have a certain rhythm to the movement that trains both sides equally so your right side and your left side are being trained to the equal degree based on the step pattern that you have and so there's a huge influence on what that does to the right and left sides of the brain because the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. And you're practicing those. So you're building like this huge amount of stamina. And then you also mentioned rhythm. Hopefully I'm not going off on these crazy uh, trains, but rhythm is so interesting because like that, that thing's fundamental. Like people say they can't dance and, and, and I would argue that there's probably very, very few people who actually can't dance or can't get better at dancing by training rhythm it's pretty deep into into like i mentioned at the very beginning how i how i've been trying to figure out universals to culture and one of those universals is dancing um and yeah music you know, right like we can all follow a beat of a drum and it's like very primal like boom and it, it, right it's like yeah like i think if you can't follow music like that it would be uh, some weird some weird condition right and, you know and it and i'm sure it, i'm sure it exists i'm sure there's people out there who, who just literally can't can't dance can't there's something in there that they can't dance but it's like it's got to be so healthy healthy and so and so capoeira involves all these and then also it involves music and i think something you know i think there's something to just being like a system of of because movement what is movement you know like is when i sing or when i speak that's a movement as well. That's using my nervous system to basically transmit symbols and stuff like that. And so I'm noticing that learning how to sing is helping me with my podcast voice. And I have an idea for get helping people ha- develop a better voice uh, learning by learning to sing. And so capoeira is really interesting for that. I'm also getting into proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. Are you aware of that one? Uh, basically, proprioception is like knowing where your body placement is without looking at it so it's like your body awareness essentially well and there's a specific stretching routine uh r- routine where you basically another person uh puts you in various ranges of mo- motion and then and then you you push them back and what that does is basically trains your proprioception as you uh, you mentioned it exactly what it is it's basically your your where you believe your body is in space and time either with eyes closed or with, with eyes open and i've been looking for somebody to teach me this and i just found somebody here in the last week and and then you know weight training as well weight training is is really amazing one of the biggest things that i learned about weight training before i actually got into it was that the first 12 weeks of uh, weight training are actually neural development and then you start to build muscle and so i have some connective tissue disorders that have made, basically made the that neural component really, really difficult. And it's taken me a lot more than 12 weeks. Um, and so I'm now just getting into that initial stages of weight training where I'm getting into those first 12 weeks. Uh, so I just threw a lot out there. Uh, was that helpful? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's like we've lot, again, I think it's especially aggravated by being internet people the last year is that 
there's so much about the human experience and body awareness that I think we've lost that art, whether it's like matching a rhythm and proprioception and yeah, just like the neural pathways of like doing a proper lift. I remember um, one of the most productive sessions was doing Olympic powerlifting. This is, yeah, like literally a year plus ago at this point now, but just like doing cleans and snatches and like being able to like get my body to move in that chain. I think I just realized that like as kids, right, we were so like nimble, like doing tag and running around and run, like basically doing parkour in obstacle course racing, just as like part of our everyday lives playing tag on the playground. And now our movements are so static and so we're constrained. I, I, I like this is my, you know, a hypothesis. I feel like that limitation of physical stimuli likely constrains like mental creativity or mental stimuli, Absolutely. right? I think there's definitely a mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. And the less we understand about our bodies, I feel like it probably likely is detrimental to our mental creative uh, aspects as well. Again, I have no evidence to suggest anything like that, but just, just my understanding of how the mind and, and, and brain and body all connects together. I think there's something there in terms of just like being so physically aware, it likely leads to mental self-awareness. And I think being mentally self-aware is so much so important in how we carry ourselves in our lives. There's no, no question about it for me that I'm, I'm, I'm completely convinced that, that the more that I go, like it's been insane the last couple of weeks where I just like the level at which my mental health is operating. I experience, of course, negative emotions and, and, but man, there's nothing better for those negative emotions than, than, than doing the capoeira kicks and, and like hitting this bag. It's just like, it's so just awesome. And, and I'm spending about four hours, four or five hours a day in, in pretty intense exercise. And so I think, you know, like I'm, I'm wasting all that time, you know, like I'm not being productive, but it's like, it's like making me like, it's, I think that sense that time and productivity have a relationship that is like one to one that if I do this exercise, then I don't do this other thing. I think that's a faulty way of looking at it and something about exercise and the, the way that it regulates dopamine gives us the endocannabinoid system high that, that is just like, um, like allows me to think through things in such a clearer way and be so much more solidified. Yeah. It's really like, there's no question. It's just like, it's so, I think most problems can be solved or a lot of problems can be solved by exercise. Yeah. I'm curious to like, like learn more about like how this body proprioception training has impacted your day-to-day -day life in a, a more tangible way. Cause I think, you know, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is by being sedentary, by looking down on our phones or by like hunched over, over a computer screen, we are training our bodies to fit, be in that position. Right. And I just, I keep thinking I got to roll my shoulders back, stand up straight, like keep my posture up. And I like doing a lot more band work to like make sure, like if, you know, I do a lot of push-ups. It's all contraction and I'm sitting over a computer screen. It's like doing more contraction. So I need to just be thoughtful about pulling and like counterbalancing all the uh, implicit training that we're doing part of our digital lives. That's one very practical application of kind of this body awareness. Do you have anecdotes or little hints or tidbits and, and, and takeaways for our listeners of how some of this training, how some of this body awareness is, how you can apply this? Yeah, I mean, the most interesting thing that I've dealt with, and I know a lot of people in San Francisco deal with, and I've worked with them a lot of, of, of helping them to, to correct some of the postural issues, I've dealt with a lot of them, is the tech neck, you know, and, and, and what happens with the tech neck, our, our head moves forward, um, and then it throws off the whole spinal chain all the way down to the feet. Um, and it could actually also have relationship with the feet. There are these really interesting receptors on the bottom of our feet uh, called Pacinian corpuscles. And these Pacinian corpuscles, they register vibration. And so if you're, and it depends on what surface you're walking on, whether they get stimulated or not. And it's really important to give them a variety of, of stimulations. And so if we're wearing shoes, it basically cuts off these, these, well, it doesn't give the proper stimulation diet. Cause if you imagine you're out in the forest, you're running around, you come across all sorts of different textures and you're, these receptors are being stimulated by those different receptors, by those different um, simulations where shoes don't have that. That is it. There's a chain that goes all the way up into the hips and the pelvic floor and the diaphragm. Uh, and then it changes the spine. And it also changes where our eyes look and because the, because the primal 
thing that our body will do no matter what is keep our eyes level. So if that means that our feet are kind of mismatched, that ch- changes things in the, in the hips that our eyes will then kind of like, or our neck will kind of form in order to make this change on this movement. And a lot of these things happen in childhood and, and a lot of them happen older. And, and it's like this kind of inertia. I, I, I can get pretty philosophical about it because, you know, there's this, there's this energy of entropy that everything breaks down. You know, we're going to die. These bodies are going to die. We're, you know, there, there, there's an end. So there's this life death thing. And then there's negative entropy. And that's this force of like being able to stand up straight and have the stress of gravity be distributed among our body in a way that's feels really amazing. And, and that just takes, like, if you think about our ancestral environment, another thing I got from Dr. Cameron Seppa is that, you know, the the hunter gatherers spend about two hours in a squat position, a passive squat position. And, you know, I, I, about 10 years ago, I could spend about a minute in a, in a squat, probably less. It was so painful to go into a squat position. And now I can spend significant more time, still not two hours a day, um, maybe it's split up, but that, and that's just one thing. And then there's, you know, walking and all these other things. And the human body was meant, was, was built under the conditions where we're moving around for the vast majority of our day. And all those things, we basically just have to, you know, recreate, uh, as human beings in this digital world. And you mentioned a few good things about like, take your calls outside, take your calls walking. It's funny. It's, wanted to tell the story. I've, 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 I've got these headphones that I bought specifically because they have an earpiece so that I could do podcasts while walking and stuff like that. But the, you know, the, I have a Google Pixel and I know it happened to the iPhone as well as they got rid of the headphone jack. So I had to buy a, an, a, an adapter for the headphone piece. And then also had to, the microphone came with an adapter. So I've got two points of failure basically. So I keep, they keep on like ripping out every time, but yeah, that's one good thing. And there's another interesting thing. I think you're, if, it, if we can go technical for a bit. So there's the actual tissue that happens once we get into these positions, the fascia chain fascia changes, it turns more plastic and it becomes kind of plastically evolves and changes the muscle dynamics and stuff like that. But then there's also a neurological component because we view the world through our past, through our past experiences. And so we have all these past experiences that have kind of our body has, has absorbed and those affect our movement as well. And the the actual neuroscience word for it is a topography. We have a a topography in our brain that kind of builds the map out of our environment. And let's go further down. The the environment is so interesting because our immediate environment, there is so much in our immediate environment that has to do with our survival because that's was so important. So it's been really interesting for me to be in this environment where I am right now. It's actually a rainforest. And so I'm in a rainforest and the, 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 just like the interesting novel ways that in subtle ways that a, a new ecology can have on our bodies is so interesting. So I invite your listeners to pay attention to that as well as like, and like, that's the real nature thing too. Cause like most of us now are, are, I was talking about our, our feet mechanoreceptors not having enough stimulation that also exists in the visual realm as well. If you spend a lot of time out in the green, out in forest and stuff like that, that's going to change your mental well, well-being as well. Yeah, I was actually just about to bring up that point, which is that when I was in Montana and Utah for a little bit uh, late last year, like it was just awesome to be able to like just see further than like 100 feet. <laughs> right like if you're just like in your apartment which is like maybe like what i don't know 50 100 feet long like you're everything's up here and i just it's like it just felt like relaxing for my eyes to be able to actually look across the horizon actually like look a few miles out you're like wow like my my brain feels a little bit more like relaxed and i think I, i'm even though i'm thoughtful about it i'm still spending way too much time in front of a screen like my eyes are tired i'm just like always looking i feel like i'm more near sighted because i'm just like looking at I'm not just like stimulating enough. But yeah, absolutely. Like we need to be thoughtful about how do we counteract all the downsides of modernity, right? <laughs> so many, and it feels like I discover a new one each day. The real, the real, the real challenge for me here in Brazil has been to figure out how to get out of the ma- microplastics because um, you know it's in everything. Like the water systems aren't that great, so you have to buy bottled water um, unless you get a filter and stuff like that. And that that one's gnarly, and it's it's in everything, and it. And nobody, nobody's conscious of it at all down here. That's been a gnarly one, but, uh, yeah, no, I'm curious. Like one thing that I, that I've been thoughtful about is the tech neck. You you mentioned that you've been helping or there's some like practical takeaways there. I'm sure a lot of us have spent too much time in front of our computer. 
what are, what are some tips, quick tips on uh, things to interact or, or be thoughtful about around tech net? There's two things to start from. As I was mentioning, you got your, it's the feet up to your eyes or the eyes down to your feet. A lot of people will choose one and say, oh, you have to, you have to concentrate on that one. I think it's a good idea to pay attention to the feet because the, the, the earth, the connection with the earth kind of, you know, gravity, gra- gravity is bringing us down. And so feet are really important, basically. And so, so finding a better relationship with your feet, self massage your feet, pull your toes apart and kind of like, and then resist that and then bring them back together as you're pulling them apart is a really good one. Getting a tennis ball on the feet to provide some sort of stimulation and just trying to like, figure out a good sti- diet stimulation diet. And then another thing people want to think about is we have this autonomic nervous system. So right now, you know, both of our nervous systems are encompassing a hu- and what I mean by nervous system is our brain um, and our spinal cord and all the nerves coming out our spinal cord into our body. And so those are all, those are ingr- for our entire life, they're on, but they're on to different degrees between stimulation and relaxation. And most of that is outside of our unconscious perception. So we have this conscious perception. Most of us mistake who we actually are for that conscious perception. That conscious perception can be really helpful. It can't be the whole thing because there are really, really deep unconscious things that will override that conscious perception very quickly if you are in danger. And so your body knows better whether you are in danger and it will it will do certain things in order to help, to help you survive that have been honed over millions of years to quickly, quickly do things. And so... One of the most interesting ways that we can kind of reset this nervous system is that this fact that we have conscious control over the breath. And so there's most of my breathing is unconscious, but then I can actually intervene and consciously change my breath. And that's so interesting because the breath brings in oxygen. It also releases carbon dioxide. And when we slow down our breathing, it lar- um, builds up a lot more carbon dioxide. Most people think when they start breathing on oh, bring in oxygen, 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 it's actually a really good idea to actually slow that process down and build up more oxygen. And then you get a, a build up more carbon dioxide. And then, so if you think about it, when we breathe in, we breathe in through the nose lungs, then take that oxygen and then spread it all throughout our blood. And so through this conscious perception of breath and this ch- conscious regulation and sometimes just awareness of breath, uh, we can have a direct key into the nervous system and reset our nervous system. For me, I had a lot of problems breathing. So I, it's taken me years. Uh, but for other people, I think they might have less issues. So, so it really depends on your individual stuff. Like, um, and if anybody's curious about this, they can find me on Twitter at Stuart Alsop, I, 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 i share a lot of, um, what I've been talking about oh, just cause I'm so freaking fascinated by it that we can literally change our bodies and change our body composition. And I just got something from Hyde on Twitter as well about a month ago, which has really, really profoundly sh- uh, shifted my life. And I wish somebody had told me about it when I was 15. You just tape your mel- mouth at night with medical tape, uh, and that will force your, you to breathe through your nose. Um, so if you have sleep apnea, you have any of these different things, you can do it. It's quite challenging to do it for the first few days. But, man, it's crazy. All these asthma problems that I used to have during intense exercise, they've all just like dissolved. And now I'm able to run, I'm able to jump, I'm able to like do all these things that were beyond me. And it's because of this composition of oxygen and carbon dioxide in my blood, which has now like been stabilized to a, to a, to a uh, healthy way. So, yeah. Which I mean, I, yeah, I mean, that's like interesting. Cause like that didn't have to do anything with the neck, but like <laughs> feet and then breath, like, <laughs> Which is, I mean, I, but I think that's like one of the funny things in terms of what I've, you know, learned and observed in, you know, being in this space is that oftentimes the root causes are far from where the symptoms are. Well, and, and right? so it, it does, it does have to do with the neck too, because your body knows how, 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 it, how it's supposed to be. So in, with that conscious intervention inside of the nervous system, you can basically give your, because you, all of our bodies are essentially reacting to modernity all the time. We've lost, we've lost our health in terms of our ancestral health of like being on our feet all the time and moving around all the time. And then we've added a whole bunch of like really intense pollutants. Uh, and so that the more that we can kind of bring that in, the more that the body will resolve the problems. I don't think we need to actually think about it as we, these conscious minds are, are solving the problems. We're just trying to basically break apart revert the patterns of Yeah, revert back to like our base existence and like break these like bad habits of modernity essentially which yeah that that, that makes sense because again like you don't need 
uh, for like a wild animal. You don't teach a tiger to like be more tiger-like, right? And I think it very much stands the reason that for humans to be more human-like, you just try to revert to our ancestral environment. <laughs> And then take the best of technology with us, right? Because I don't think you're not a Luddite, I'm not a Luddite, right? Like I like technology and I'm very like, pro technology, but I think it's like, while we're in pursuit of progress, like it's not destroy like what makes us humans. And, and there's some really interesting people doing some interesting stuff about how to marry old technologies, uh, old patterns of psychotechnologies and old ways of doing with new technology. They're really interesting. I just, I just interviewed a guy who is uh, down here in Brazil and I mentioned I'm in a rainforest and he basically took over the rainforest that had been cut down in order to do pastures. And he's basically um, rebuilt the land. And uh, he was talking about some of the ways that we can kind of use this amazing technology that we have to all, but also marry it with like deep understandings that we built over thousands, thousands of years of how, how to live in relationship with nature. hundred percent. Well, I mean, we're running up against our time here. So, you know, this is like a fun, wide ranging conversation. We'll have to continue the conversation again soon. But yeah, like, I mean, we're towards, you know, we're just in February 21. What's it look like for you for the rest of the year? I mean, any plans? Are you just taking it day by day? Where do people follow along uh, on your journey? You mentioned Twitter. Where else do people find you? Yeah, so uh, you can find my podcast. It's on iTunes, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, any of the major podcasting platforms. It's called Crazy Wisdom. Uh, I've got, I've, I've slowed down quite a bit. I've done like 150 episodes, uh, and so if you're interested, you can look at my backlog. I've got some really interesting. I've, I've, the pandemic has changed me quite a bit, and the changed what I talk about quite a bit. So um, I've got some, and it's made me more real, I think, in some ways. Uh, so, so I'm starting to release some content that is, I, I, I'm very proud of, and, and, and I hope that people will find value from it. Um, yeah. And on Twitter at Stuart Alsop, I, 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 and then in terms of my future, uh, I'm developing a new form of body work that has been a process for the last 15 years. And it, I'm really, really excited about it. So I'll be talking more about that on, on Twitter. So you can find more information on that on Twitter. And uh, yeah, my goal for is to come back to California and start setting up a farm because I want to basically get myself, it's not a total cutoff from the supply chain, but basically become more self-sufficient. And I would highly encourage those of you with means um, and who are hesitant about our new bureaucratic system and being inside of a city to start thinking about ways that you can potentially just become a little bit more self-sufficient in case things uh, change drastically. Cool. So let's do that conversation in person when you, there's some when it's getting set up so that would be a fun chat to to have you back on for yeah and you should come up you should definitely come up to uh to to the land uh it's, it's yeah 100 yeah. percent. We'll, we'll make it a date yeah. um awesome Stuart. thanks so much always fun to catch up and then yeah you know good luck and and, and, and see you stateside very very soon Hey, this is Jeff Wu from HVM in here. If you like this podcast, check out my new favorite podcasting app called Shuffle App. Use Shuffle to find your favorite clip from this episode, post on Twitter and Instagram, and tag us at HVMN. And the best clip will win a free variety pack of our brand new keto food bars. They're great, super keto compliant, certified organic, tastes delicious. Check out keto food bars and check out Shuffle.